As parents, we all naturally want the best for our children, and we are typically concerned with their future security when our influence in their lives has waned and they assume independent control. In the context of contemporary society, financial security dominates the great majority of people's concerns. This leads to the necessity of ensuring our children's opportunity for financial comfort and success. In today's world, the obvious way to accomplish this is by providing education, which will ostensibly give them the tools for obtaining that security that we so much desire for them. We then turn to the institutions of education prevalent today, where there is a choice of private and public schools. With our kids' future in mind, we then give them over to teachers who are either directly agents of government or indirectly agents through government certification. For 12 highly formative, impressionable years, we trust our children to strangers who perform curricula which they themselves have not designed, nor have we had any influence in its guidelines. Do we really know what education our children are receiving? Do we really know if it's bringing out our children's full potential, or even if it intends to. It's a massive commitment to trust your children to strangers representing institutions. These are questions that we should be capable of answering with utter conviction before we even consider giving them over. Are we aware of the origin of modern schooling and the purpose it was created for? Was it not instituted, mandated, made compulsory for the benevolent purpose of educating? Again, these are questions that should be answerable. What is the underlying philosophy that modern education is predicated upon? Would you still give your children's malleable years over to strangers if their philosophy was grossly contradictory to your own? These are questions in which the answers have to be known. Otherwise, you are ignorantly and blindly trusting your children to government, so-called experts, and the powers that be. This documentary will attempt to answer these questions. To understand the current predicament of education in America, we first need to revise the history of its origin and roots. In pre-Civil War America, the vast majority of education, excluding the sparse common schools in New England, which were created by the Puritans for the purpose of inculcating religious doctrine, was completely decentralized and on a laissez-faire basis with negligible government influence. Students and parents volunteered for the kind of education that they deemed desirable, with copious options ranging from family schools, small private schools, religious schools, craft schools, farm schools, common schools, grammar schools, homeschooling, or even self-education. In his book, The Underground History of American Education, John Taylor Gatto writes, Looking back 
Abundant data exists from states like Connecticut and Massachusetts to show that by 1840, the incidence of complex literacy in the United States was between 93 and 100 percent. According to the Connecticut Consensus of 1840, only one citizen out of every 579 was illiterate. And an article in the Journal of Education of 1828 gave this accounting of American literacy. Our population is 12 million. For meeting the intellectual wants of this 12 million, we have about 600 newspapers and periodical journals. There is no country, it is often said, where the means of intelligence are so generally enjoyed by all ranks and where knowledge is so generally diffused among the lower orders of the community as in our own. The fact of the matter is that the advent of public schooling was not the cause of an educated America, that before the introduction of government schooling and compulsory laws, Ordinary Americans were highly literate and highly educated. And of the 117 men who signed the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution, one out of three had only a few months of formal schooling and only one in four had gone to college. It is therefore not surprising that the United States Constitution made no mention of education in its provisions. Its framers left education to the volition of the individuals. It was principally in Boston where a system of government schools received popular support which can be understood by the emergence of Unitarianism Unitarianism postulated that education was the panacea to eradicate evil because the creation of an institution to improve the character of man could eliminate ignorance, which in turn would eliminate poverty, which then would eliminate social injustice, and then finally, abolish all crime. However, they concluded that only a government system of education could undertake this ostensibly beneficent task. For private schools were administered by individuals who might have entirely different views concerning the nature of man, and were forced by economic reality to concentrate solely on teaching skills rather than molding the children's character. Early Americans were obstinately antithetical to government intrusion in their affairs. And the idea of a centralized, government-provided education was understood to be a clear threat to their recently obtained liberty. However, serendipitously for the Unitarians and public school advocates, Contemporaneous developments in Europe during the early 19th century conveniently created a political climate conducive to the course of action the Unitarians were to pursue. The emergence of nationalism during the 19th century allowed the concept of a national system of education to become a widely accepted tenet of status policy. In 1806, Holland became the first country to create a national system of public education. And in 1819, the Prussians followed suit, adopting a centralized state system that was to become the very model the Unitarians would espouse to implement in America. Meanwhile, during the emergence of nationalism in Europe, an Englishman named Robert Owen began publishing his provocative ideas on social reform. He would later become known as the father of modern socialism. Owen came to public prominence through his unconventional administration of the spinning mills in New Lanark, Scotland, 
where he established a community for his workers and their families that provided conditions idyllic for their time. However, perhaps the most notable provision was Owen's construction of his school, called the Institute for the Formation of Character, and a subsequent infant school established a year later. Like the Unitarians, he had radical ideas on how to improve the human race. And again like the Unitarians, it necessitated schooling the children. He felt you could actually mold human character. And he in fact said it is of all truths the most important that man's character is made for, not by himself. So he's an environmental determinist, and he believes that if you can begin virtually at birth and have this child in a superior environment, then you will, through education and liberation of this person's intellect and spirit, you will actually produce a perfect character. From his premise of environmental determination, he extrapolated that the ramifications of capitalism and religion were the creation of a competitive, irrational environment that made men evil. The remedy was simply to inculcate a penchant for cooperation and rationality and to negate selfishness and superstition. This would be accomplished through education and ensured because of the plasticity of children Children are, without exception, passive and wonderfully contrived compounds, which by due preparation and accurate attention, founded on a correct knowledge of the subject, may be formed collectively into any human character. And although these compounds, like all other works of nature, possess endless varieties, yet they partake of that plastic quality, which by perseverance under judicious management, may be ultimately moulded into the very image of rational wishes and desires. Ironically, in 1825, the first experiment in modern secular communism took place in the United States, when Robert Owen left Scotland to create a social utopia in New Harmony, Indiana. By 1826, one year after the commencement of the community, the preliminary phase was deemed a success and Owen instituted full communism at New Harmony. However, the optimism was abruptly quelled when official failure was acknowledged one year later. Owen's son, Robert Dale Owen, expounds that the reason for its failure was a consequence of the early antisocial circumstances that had surrounded many of the quickly collected inhabitants of New Harmony before their arrival there. It appeared that the members were too various in their feelings and too dissimilar in their habits to govern themselves harmoniously as one community. The great lesson learned by Owen and his followers was that education had to precede the creation of a communist society. For people educated under the old system were too selfish, too uncooperative, and too incorrigible. Henceforth, Owen and his followers would actively promote national public education. It was now adjudged as a prerequisite to the realization of socialism. Although both the Owenites and the Unitarians agreed that the government should assume full control of education, the Owenites' plan was far more radical than anything the Unitarians advocated. The Owenites wanted children to be separated from their parents as early as possible, age 2 was suggested, and placed in district boarding schools away from the influences of the prevailing system. Parents would be limited to visitations and under no circumstances were to interfere with or interrupt the rules of the institution. 
It was axiomatic that for the attainment of utopia, parents' rights had to be usurped in order to ensure the right character formation of their children. And so, by the 1830s, there were principally two parties that vigorously advocated public education, the Socialists and the Unitarians. The Socialists saw public education as an instrument for the reformation of human character, which was now a prerequisite to the realization of socialism, whereas the Unitarians saw this institution as the means for perfecting man and eradicating evil. Also worth mentioning is that below this tier of influence also contained a large group of religious conservatives and educators who favoured government schooling. The religious conservatives were intent on utilising public education to maintain the predominantly Protestant Anglo-Saxon culture against the rising tide of Catholic emigration and the educators saw a lucrative centralized market for their textbooks and paraphernalia, occupational security and better salaries through the concomitant taxes. Four parties with four agendas. Despite all the above, there was extensive opposition to the introduction of government education and they consisted of entrepreneurs, conservative legislators, taxpayers, and most importantly, those who opposed government infringements on individual freedom. The advocates of a national system of education required a model for their grandiose plans, and they found that model in 19th century Prussia which was subsequently imported as the underlying design and philosophy of the American public school system. Anyone with a modicum of knowledge of Prussia will know that this state was not a beacon of freedom and liberty for the masses, far from it, and their educational system certainly did not intend to liberate the individual from the thraldom of ignorance. The Prussian Empire was a militaristic monarchy located in what is today northeastern Germany and western Poland. By the 1800s, it emerged as one of the greatest military powers in the world, known for their obedience, diligence and regimentation, which one can partly ascribe to the philosopher Johann Fichte and the impact of the Napoleonic Wars. Victor wrote a series of, it was over a dozen public essays to the Prussian king from, let's say, let me say, 1808 to about 1818. They're called Addresses to the German Nation. And the provocative event that set the first one off was the Prussian army, which was the Prussian economy, renting soldiers, stealing other people's stuff, had been whipped by Napoleon's amateur army at the Battle of Jena in 1806. And Fichte said it was because this demon imagination was loose among ordinary soldiers and in situations they would override the orders from headquarters about what to do, and that's why we lost. Fichte blamed the infiltration of Enlightenment beliefs as the primary reason for the downfall. He called for remedial action to the absolute revision of public schooling. In a word, it is total change of the existing system of education that I propose as the sole means of preserving the existence of the German nation. Fichte elaborated that education must get to the source of human nature. It must exert 
an influence penetrating to the roots of vital impulse and action. Traditional education had failed because it had relied upon and appealed to the student's free will. I should reply that that very recognition of and reliance upon free will in the pupil is the first mistake of the old system. Fichte then went on to repudiate individualism and called for its eradication. By means of the new education, we want to mold the Germans into a corporate body which shall be stimulated and animated in all its individual members by the same interest. Instead, he advocated that education should inculcate the pure love of duty for its own sake. In place of that love of self with which nothing of our good can be connected any longer, we must set up and establish in the hearts of all those whom we wish to reckon among our nation that other kind of love which is concerned directly with the good simply as such and for its own sake. Like Owen and the Socialists, he urged that from the very beginning the pupil should be continuously and completely under the influence of this education and should be separated altogether from the community and kept from all contact with it. Parents were perceived as corrupt and their educational influence had to be nullified. In other words, his educational program consisted of communal separation of children, severe authoritarian top-down training, strict moral duty, and selflessness. Following Fichte's exhortation, Prussia's goal was now to have a militaristic and precision-based society, and they designed the school system to achieve this goal. A system that would later captivate foreign visitors like Horace Mann and many others who would then advocate its replication in America. In the essay The Prussian Industrial History of Public Schooling, the author writes, children were depersonalized and isolated from each other at an early age. Seated in rows, they were easily silenced, controlled and forced to engage in road tasks whose sole purpose was to inculcate obedience taught fragmented subjects that deprived them of context and perspective. Their thinking was intentionally and systematically stunted. These practices shaped the curriculum of the Prussian public schools for over a century. As late as 1919, German public schools were described by German philosopher Kurt Eisner as veritable drill academies in which children could be intellectually crippled for life. By the mid-1830s, the political and intellectual class supporting public education had decided that the American system should be molded after the Prussian one, despite the system's oppressive, statist features. Along with Robert Owen, they tacitly adopted the Prussian attitude of bypassing and disregarding parental wishes on matters of their children's education. The parental-child relationship was considered subordinate to the child's relationship to the state or educator. The alienation of child from parent was implicit in the whole Prussian system. And in 1852, Massachusetts became the first state to make school attendance compulsory along the lines of Prussian standards heralding the epoch of American acceptance of government-controlled education. By 1918, 66 years after the first ratification of forced schooling in Massachusetts, 48 states had enacted compulsory school attendance laws along the lines of Prussian standards, which finalized the total government takeover 
of American education. It was in Massachusetts. It spread very, very slowly. It wasn't for 15 more years that another state followed suit. So it hardly was a gift of, to the populous portion of America. I smile a little bit when I say that because the mythology is that it was greeted everywhere with great enthusiasm. Not only did parents resist compulsory schooling, they sometimes did so violently. So vehement was the opposition in Barnstable on Cape Cod that state militia were brought in to march children to school under armed guard. A primary reason why the mass of the American population resisted compulsory schooling was a widespread belief that its purpose had little to do with education and everything to do with control. The acceptance of government intrusion in education reflected America's gradual move from a once libertarian constitutional republic to the now prevalent democratic statism. Influential to this radical transformation was the philosophy imbibed by the many Americans who in their captivation of Prussia were exposed to German idealism. Perhaps most seminal was the work of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Hegel, along with Fichte and von Schelling, belonged to the period of German idealism in the decades following Immanuel Kant. Since the rise of Kant in German philosophy over 200 years ago, there has emerged a philosophical dichotomy relating to the nature of the state, society and culture. In the United States, Britain and France, philosophy is predicated on the individual and the rights of the individual. Whereas in Germany, from the time of Kant through Fichte and Hegel up to 1945, the root philosophy has been universal brotherhood, rejection of individualism and opposition to Western liberal thought in almost all its aspects. German idealism was the underlying foundation of Karl Marx's work and the left Hegelians, as well as Bismarck, Hitler, and the right Hegelians. Anthony Sutton, in his book, elaborates, from the Hegelian system of political thought, alien to most of us in the West, stem such absurdities as the state seen as the march of God through history, that the state is also God, that the only duty of a citizen is to serve God by serving the state, that the state is absolute reason, that a citizen can only find freedom by worship and utter obedience to the state. Hegelian absurdities have thoroughly penetrated the US educational system under pressure from such organizations as the National Education Association and major foundations. individuals such as you and I, or anybody watching this program, will be cogs in the state, but we have no individual rights. Our rights for, rights for Hegel, individual rights for Hegel, come about through obedience to the state. Uh, we see it in the educational process, which we'll probably talk about later, that we have adopted what I call a Hegelian system of education, which is not to bring out your innate talents, but to prepare you to be an individual cog in the state. To be an individual cog in the state. Individual cog in the state. Today's education stems from Hegelian social theory combined with experimental psychology. The origin of this conflation can be ascribed to Wilhelm Wundt's work at the University of Leipzig, Germany. Prior to Wundt, psychology was regarded as a branch of philosophy and consequently conducted primarily by rational analysis. Disenchanted with this approach, 
Wundt founded experimental psychology in which he imitated the experimental methods used by the natural sciences. He then established the world's first psychological laboratory in Leipzig in 1879, which is generally considered as the official beginning of psychology as a field of science distinct from philosophy and physiology. Wundt is important in the history of American education for the following reasons. He established in 1875 the world's first laboratory in experimental psychology to measure individual responses to stimuli. Two, Wundt believed that man is only the summation of his experience, the stimuli that bear upon him. It follows from this that for Wundt, man has no self-will no self-determination. Man is in effect only the captive of his experiences, a pawn needing guidance. In other words, man was devoid of spirit and without volition. He assumed that there was nothing to begin with but a body, a brain, and a nervous system, and that we are merely the totality of our daily experiences and the stimuli to which we are exposed. The ramifications of his premise meant that education should now become the process of exposing the student to meaningful experiences through which the individual will learn to respond to any given stimulus with the correct response. Funt's thesis laid the philosophical foundation for the formulation of the principles of conditioning and behaviorism, which as we'll see, are crucially influential in the current establishment of schooling. Besides Wundt's theoretical contribution, his second major impact was that he produced the first generation of researchers, professors, and publicists in the new psychology. Many in turn went on to establish schools of education or departments of psychology, where they trained a plethora of PhD students throughout Europe and the US in the new science. Among some of the influential American students of Wundt were G. Stanley Hall, who organized the psychology lab at John Hopkins in 1887, James McKean Cattle, who became the professor and administrative head of psychology at Columbia University. James Baldwin, who set up the psych lab at Princeton. Charles Judd, who became director of education at the University of Chicago. And James Earl Russell, the president of Teachers College at Columbia. Wundt's work can be perceived as an adjunct to Hegelian philosophical theory, wherein Hegel viewed the individual as a valueless cog in the state. Wundt expanded this denigration to include man as nothing more than an animal, controlled by daily experiences. G. Stanley Hall was the first American to work in Wundt's new experimental psychology laboratory in the University of Leipzig. And following his return to the United States, he played an instrumental role in the penetration of German experimental psychology into American educational theory. So what was Hall's view on education? In his essay, The Education of the Will, Hall posits, the only duty of small children is habitual and prompt obedience. He argued that character must be shaped and molded so to ensure that those people who are destined to become obedient servants in fact do so. And the few who are rare moral geniuses that are destined for leadership, well they can be trained to follow their true nature. Unfortunately for the common folk, Hull posits that they aren't fit for freedom and should be obligated to receive a different form of training. For most of us, the best education is that which makes us the best and most obedient servants. This is the way of peace and the way of nature, reserving only the smallest margin of independence and material interests 
choice of masters, etc. Essentially, Paul believed that most ordinary high school students were a great army of incapables who should be in schools for the dullards or subnormal children. And over the course of their lives, they should only concern themselves with material interests and choice of masters. All decisions of importance will be reserved for the elites, who courtesy of their moral disposition receive an education fit for free men, while the rest of us graduate as obedient slaves. Another student of Wunz was James Earl Russell, who received his doctorate from Leipzig in 1894. Three years later, he became the dean of the recently established Teachers College in Columbia University, where for the next 30 years, he would build the largest institution in the world for the training of teachers. Henceforth, Wundtian experimental psychology would be interconnected with American education. Working closely with James McKean Cattle, Russell began to assemble a faculty to undertake the task of dispensing a new science, that of educational psychology. One of Cattle's recruitments was Edward Lee Thorndike who is perhaps the most notable psychologist trained by the first generation of Wundt's disciples. His dissertation titled Animal Intelligence, published in 1898, was a milestone in the history of psychology. It inaugurated the laboratory study of animal learning, which postulated that animal behavior observed under experimental conditions could assist in elucidating the nature of human behavior. Following Cattell's suggestion, Thorndike began formulating theories of pedagogy based on the results of his experiments with animals. These theories would then form the foundation of educational psychology. If an action brings a reward, Thorndike believed that that action becomes stamped into the mind. In his thesis, he explained further his ideas about learning, that behavior changes because of its consequences. He called this his law of effect. In other words, the law of effect states that satisfactory outcomes of any response tended to stamp in their connection with the given situation, while unsatisfactory outcomes tended to stamp out the connection. The previous theories had accepted repetition as the potent factor in learning. The novelty of Thorndike's assertion was that he laid equal importance on the effect, that is, on success or failure, reward or punishment, satisfaction or annoyance to the learner. So this meant that if one wanted to reinforce a certain response, they would gratify the child upon demonstration of the desired behavior. And if one wanted to eliminate a response, they would simply do the opposite. Paolo Lioni illuminates the implications of this in his book, The Leipzig Connection. This thinking favors a society which operates more on the basis of gratification than on the basis of reason or responsibility. Previously, of course, good behavior was considered its own reward. The idea of rewarding a child for behaving like a human being would only occur to someone who supposes that the child is basically an animal. The new science of education would solely focus on training the students to react in situations with the behavior the scientists deemed correct. In Thorndike's book, The Principles of Teaching Based on Psychology, he proposed that the new definition of teaching would be the art of giving and withholding stimuli with the result of producing or preventing certain responses. 
The aim of the teacher is to produce desirable and prevent undesirable changes in human beings by producing and preventing certain responses. Thorndike, like many other social scientists of the day, was convinced that utopia could only be achieved when power was invested in men of superior intellect and virtue. A fusion of science character and social planning that resonated with the eugenic doctrines of Francis Galton. As a great admirer, Thorndike dedicated his first book, The Human Nature Club, to Galton. They shared the same view that science depends on the quantification of phenomena and he was greatly attracted to Galton's social philosophy. Throughout Thorndike's writings, the supposition that human ability is largely determined by birth acts as a theoretical premise from which he continuously draws the conclusion that progress depends on identifying and training each person for the social role to which they are most suited. Because Thorndike believed that intelligence and virtue vary directly with race and class, he fully embraced the negative as well as the positive doctrines of eugenics, as exemplified by his postulation in human nature and the social order. By selective breeding, supported by a suitable environment, we can have a world in which all men will equal the top 10% of present men. One sure service which the inferior and vicious can perform is to prevent their genes from survival. This is a man who was incontrovertibly influential in the establishment of modern education, and he is certainly not alone in his sentiments. As parents, you have to realize that philosophies such as Hegel's statism and Galton's eugenics pave the foundation on which our so-called educational system is built upon. While Thorndike developed and formulated this science for the new education, John Dewey imparted the social aims for the new school which came from his admiration of Hegelian philosophy and socialism. It followed that the priority of the new school would be social cohesion. Well, what was John Dewey's curriculum? He said, we have got to downgrade the literacy skills. We've got to downgrade the academic skills. And we've got to emphasize the social skills. Dewey replaced the traditional role of the teacher as an educator with the concept of the teacher as a guide in the socialization of the child. That is, to lead each youngster to adapt the specific behavior required of him in order for social cohesion within the group. From this, we can infer that Dewey's education is not child-centered. It does not place the enhancement of the individual's cognitive abilities as paramount. But instead, it prioritizes social ends, which translates into a state-centered educational system. Because for the Hegelian, social ends are always state ends. Anthony Sutton elucidates the schism between parents and the state. This is where the gulf of misunderstanding between modern parents and the educational system begins.
Parents believe a child goes to school to learn skills to use in the adult world. But Dewey states specifically that education is not a preparation for future living. The Dewey educational system does not accept the role of developing a child's talents, but contrarily, only to prepare the child to function as a unit in an organic whole. In blunt terms, a cog in the wheel of an organic society. Whereas most Americans have moral values rooted in the individual, the values of the school system are rooted in the Hegelian concept of the state as the absolute. For Hegel, the individual has no value except for the function he or she performs for society. He said, the state is the absolute reality and the individual himself has objective existence, truth and morality only in his capacity as a member of the state. Extrapolating from Hegel's premise, John Dewey believed that education's priority was to prepare the individual to fit into society rather than develop the individual's innate talents. This is not an educational system. This is a system of indoctrination. Schools would become an institution to transfer state-approved beliefs and opinions to children. A system designed to perpetuate the establishment. Maintaining the social order would be its fundamental purpose. So inculcating obedience was paramount. Along with teaching children to believe in authority, bow down to authority and never question authority. The individual would be indoctrinated to obey the state, obey the collective, and submit to the social order. In 1918, the cardinal principles of secondary education were issued by the Commission on the Reorganization of Secondary Education. The significance of this report is that it heralded the shift in emphasis from intellectual development to social development, just as Dewey had advocated. It marked the epoch of government intrusion in more than just academics. From now on, the state would not only ensure educational opportunities, but also indoctrinate students in how they should live. The cardinal principles reflected the influence of the new psychology and Dewey's educational agenda of socialization. I have something here. I have the six purposes of schooling as laid down in 1917 by the man who Harvard named their honor lecture in education for. These are the six purposes or functions as he calls them. The first he calls the adjustive function. Schools are to establish fixed habits of reaction to authority. Number two he calls, he calls it the integrating function, but it's easier to understand if you call it the conformity function. It's to make children as alike as possible, the gifted children and the stupid as alike as possible. The third function he calls the directive function. School is to diagnose your proper social role and then to log the evidence that here's where you are in the Great Pyramid so that future people won't allow you to escape that compartment. The fourth function 
is the differentiating function. Because once you've diagnosed kids in this layer, you do not want them to learn anything that the higher layers are learning. So you teach just as far as the requirements of that layer. Number five is the selective function. What that means is what Darwin meant by natural selection. You're assessing the breeding quality of each individual kid. You're doing it structurally because school teachers don't know this is happening. And you're trying to use ways to prevent the poor stuff from breeding. And those ways are hanging labels, humiliating labels around their neck, encouraging the shallowness of thinking, you know. And the sixth is the propiedutic function, that to continue a social form required some people being trained that they were the custodians of this. The establishment of education as a science in universities and the redesign of public schools necessitated huge sums of money and curiously these funds were found to emanate from number 26 Broadway, New York, the corporate home of Standard Oil Company, which was owned by the notorious John D. Rockefeller Sr. By 1910, Rockefeller owned assets worth over $800 million, which today would equate to approximately 19 billion. However, his enormous wealth and deviousness caused him to receive public castigation. He desperately needed to ameliorate his public image, and philanthropy seemed like the most effective method to do so. After financing the construction of the University of Chicago, Rockefeller was overwhelmingly besieged by requests for money. So we employed Frederick Taylor Gates to delegate the copious philanthropic decisions off his shoulders. In 1902, Rockefeller and Frederick Gates created the General Education Board, which was a philanthropic organization for the promotion of education within the United States without a distinction of race, sex, or creed. Well, that sounds nice. Unfortunately, the surreptitious intent behind the General Education Board was disclosed in their first mission statement. In our dreams, we have limitless resources and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hands. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or men of science. In reality, the board was created to exert leverage over American education and concurrently safeguard the Rockefeller image against all chastisements. In effect, Rockefeller's Education Trust became a virtually unlimited source of finance amenable to the progressive psychologists and their grand designs for American education. As a result of the grants, Teachers College experienced a meteoric rise. It rapidly grew to become the leading graduate college for education. Paolo Leone describes the ramifications in his book, The Leipzig Connection. The year after Rockefeller's General Education Board had set Teachers College financially on its feet, Thorndike published the first volume of his masterwork, Educational Psychology. By 1904, he was entrenched as full professor and head of the new Department of Educational Psychology at Teachers College. That same year, after a decade in Chicago experimenting with children, John Dewey joined the faculty of Columbia University as a member of the Departments of Philosophy and Education 
in a unique position to influence advanced students in Teachers College. With Russell Cattle Thorndike and other Vontians, Dewey set the ball rolling for an amalgam of educational psychology and socialism. It became known as progressive education and emanating from Columbia's Teachers College for the next half century, it slowly but surely became commonplace in every school in the country. The General Education Board continue to fund Teachers College as well as the Progressive Education Association, the National Education Association and others to the tune of $324 million. By 1953, educational psychology had reached out from Teachers College and was applied into virtually every public school In 1913, the 62nd Congress created a commission to investigate the role of these new large foundations. After a year of testimony, it proclaimed, The domination of men, in whose hands the final control of a large part of American industry rests, is not limited to their employees, but is being rapidly extended to control the education and social services of the nation. The commission elucidated how the foundation wields such influence. The giant foundation exercises enormous power through direct use of its funds, free of any statutory entanglements so they can be directed precisely to the levers of a situation. This power, however, is substantially increased by building collateral alliances which insulate it from criticism and scrutiny. Perhaps even more illuminating was the 1954 Congressional Investigation into Foundations. Known as the Rees Committee, its mandate was to mount a comprehensive inquiry into both the motives for establishing foundations and their influence on public life. Unfortunately, national newspapers lambasted the new investigation and coupled with other potent political adversaries, the committee was forced to end prematurely. But not before Norman Dodd, the chief investigator, presented his report and revealed his incendiary findings. That what we had uncovered was the determination of these large endowed foundations through their trustees to actually get control over the content of American education. That effect was to orient our educational system over away from support of the uh, principles embodied in the Declaration of Independence and implemented in the Constitution. You have spoken before about uh, some interesting things that were discovered by Catherine Casey at the Carnegie Endowment. She came back at the end of two weeks with the following on, on dictaphone belts. We are now at the year 1908, which was the year that the Carnegie began operations. And in that year, the trustees meeting for the first time raise a specific question, which they discuss throughout the balance of the year in a very learned fashion. And the question is, is there any means known more effective than war, assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people? And they conclude that no, no, no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. So then in 1909, they raise the second question and discuss it, namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? Then finally, they answer that question as follows. We must control the State Department. Then time passes, and we are eventually in a war, which would have been World War I. And at that time, they record on their minutes a shocking report 
in which they dispatched to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to see that the war does not end too quickly. And finally, of course, we are, <clears throat> the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914 when World War I broke out. At that point, they come to the conclusion that to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. To them, it is too big for them alone, so they approach the Rockefeller Foundation with the suggestion that that portion of education, which is, could be considered domestic, be handled by the Rockefeller Foundation, and that portion, which is international, should be handled by the endowment. And they then decide that the key to the success of these two operations lay in the, an alteration of the teaching of American history. And then toward the end of the 1920s, the endowment grants to the American Historical Association $400,000 for a study of our history in a manner which points to what can this country be, can it look forward to, the last volume of which is, of course, in essence, a summary of the contents of the other six. And the essence of the last volume is the future of this country belongs to collectivism administered with characteristic American efficiency. Like Robert Owen and John Dewey, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Endowment actively sought to transform American society from the once individual liberty-based community to a Galian collectivist statism a system where your children only have value in their capacity as a member of the state. It was obvious that no one would voluntarily concede their inherent rights as an individual to a centralized power structure. So it was adjudged that the control of education would permit the indoctrination of future generations with a collectivist, docile, and obedient penchant, which would concoct conditions conducive to the manifestation of a control system, the global society that you have been born into today. According to further findings of Norman's report not mentioned in the interview, the philanthropic foundations influence educational and social agencies such as the National Education Society, the American Council on Education, the National Research Council, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Progressive Education Association, the American Historical Association, and the League for Industrial Democracy. By bestowing grants, they assume effective control over organizations through the threat of withholding money and by deciding what organizations receive vital funding and which don't. The report also revealed that the foundation-approved educational product originates from predominantly empirical research in the social sciences, especially psychology, In the first decades of the 20th century, a small group of famous academics, symbolically led by John Dewey and Edward Thorndike of Columbia Teachers College, Elwood Coverley of Stanford, and a handful of others, together with their corporate and financial allies like J.P. Morgan, Vincent Astor, Commodore Whitney, Andrew Carnegie, and John D. Rockefeller, decided to bend government schooling to the service of business and the political state as it had been done 
nearly a century before in Prussia. A higher mission for this project existed too, one to catch the imagination of dreamers and to fire the blood. School was to serve as an instrument for managing evolution, establishing the preconditions for selective breeding. In Thorndike's memorable words, and you remember Thorndike is the creator of what we call educational psychology. In Thorndike's memorable words, this had to be done quickly before the new industrial masses, quote, take things into their own hands. Standardized testing would eventually be used to separate those fit to breed and fit to work from those unfit. is to move education away from what we have right now, which is traditional education. That's, you have so many Carnegie units, you had four classes of math and four classes of English and so many classes of history to graduate, to what is called outcome-based education. Outcome-based education says that the, the student must demonstrate something in order to meet the goal and be promoted or graduate. Everything rides on the goals and on meeting the goals. So instead of saying the schools will teach, the theory now is the student will demonstrate. And so it's a major shift in the way we look at education. To understand the current model of education practice today, that is the outcome-based system, we still have to cover a few more seminal psychologists, starting with Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov, a former student of Leipzig University who conducted Nobel Prize winning research on digestion. Pavlov specifically studied the role of saliva in dogs' digestive processes. And it was during this research that he accidentally made a breakthrough which would profoundly influence the field of psychology, specifically behaviorism. He had stumbled upon the phenomenon called the conditioned reflex whereby systems of physical function thought to be fixed biologically, like the salivation of dogs, could in fact be rewired to arbitrarily administered stimuli, like a metronome or bell. More technically described, the conditioned stimulus, the bell, acquired the ability to produce the response, salivation, because it was paired or associated with the unconditioned stimulus, the meat. What had happened was that the dogs had made a connection between the sound of the bell and the anticipation of food. A new behavior had been conditioned. This is termed as classical conditioning. As we'll see, Pavlov's research is the foundation on which others like John B. Watson and B.F. Skinner have developed their ideas, which was effectively the application of the laws of conditioning to human beings, akin to what Pavlov applied to animals. Often credited as the father of modern behaviorism, John B. Watson's work today is usually found as standard material in most introductory psychology and educational psychology texts. In 1913, Watson published his famous article titled Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It. In the article, he postulated that psychology had failed in its quest to become a natural science as a consequence of its focus on consciousness and other unseen phenomena. He then endeavored to bring to psychology the same measure of objectivity that marked the natural sciences by exhorting the careful study of strictly observable behavior, meaning the negation of consciousness. In his book titled Behaviorism, Watson expounds that behaviorism holds that the subject matter of human psychology is the behavior of the human being. Behaviorism claims that consciousness is neither a definite nor a usable concept. 
Following Pavlov's conditioning experiments on animals, Watson applied the same concept to human beings in his infamous and highly controversial research, today known as the Little Albert Experiment. The study consisted of Watson attempting to condition a severe emotional response in Albert, a nine-month-old baby. To prove that environment is more powerful than genetics, Watson designs an experiment for an infant known as Little Albert. He's so confident, he films it for posterity. At first, Albert shows little fear even when Watson places a burning newspaper in front of him. Albert is also unafraid when he encounters a white rat for the first time in his life. But then Watson shows Albert the rat accompanied by a loud clanging noise. One of the few things that upsets little Albert. And he does it again. And does it again. Eventually, Albert learns to fear not just the rat, but all furry things, even without the loud noise. In Watson's mind, the little Albert experiment is a success because it proves that fears are learned, not inherited. This experiment demonstrated that Watson was able to create a new stimulus response link. When Albert saw white, furry objects, the conditioned stimulus, the loud noise, a conditioned response of fear. This study is generally presented as evidence that even complex behaviors, such as emotions, can be conditioned through the manipulation of one's environment. Watson in Behaviorism informs us that the interest of a behaviorist in man's doings is more than the interest of the spectator. He wants to control and manipulate other natural phenomena. It is the business of behavioristic psychology to be able to predict and to control human activity. Why is it not surprising that this train of thought led to the rapid introduction of behaviorism into educational psychology and then eventually the majority of American public schools? By the 1950s, behavioral psychology had become the scientific foundation of American pedagogy. And so if you detect something mindless about today's education, it's merely because the mind has been taken out of it. Only visible behavior counts. The next behaviorist to greatly influence education was B.F. Skinner, whose most notable contribution was the formulation of operant conditioning, which can be described as an adjunct to Thorndike's Law of Effect, which postulated that the consequence of a response determines whether the inclination to repeat the same response will grow stronger or weaker. Skinner's input was the introduction of reinforcement into the law of effect, which is defined as an extrinsic consequence that increases the probability that a behavior will reoccur. While some scientists engineer shiny new consumer goods for an eager public, Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner seeks nothing less than the engineering of human nature. In experiments with subjects as simple as pigeons, Skinner declares that with the right social engineering, we can create a new breed of human being. Skinner is firmly in the behaviorist tradition pioneered by John Watson in the 1920s. 
like Watson, Skinner contends that with the right tools, we can predict and control behavior. He develops a system called operant conditioning to prove that a behavior will be repeated by a subject when rewarded. Repetition leads to reinforcement. Reinforcement to changes in behavior. This hungry pigeon is moving about more or less at random. Sometimes it turns its head to the left. When it does, we reinforce that movement by giving the pigeon access to a dish of grain. Skinner then waits for it to turn further. Again, more food. Ultimately, the pigeon will turn in a complete circle, having learned that only when he turns will he be rewarded. And Skinner believes that if it works for pigeons, why not people? In Skinner's mind, behavior is behavior, up and down the evolutionary scale, and it is all learned. One of the great successes is in education. People are taught to do more complicated tasks than anyone had thought possible by breaking down behavior into small steps and giving positive reinforcement along the way. The essence of Skinner's work was that we could manipulate the environment in ways that would permit us to produce any kind of behavior that we wished and we could develop individuals in ways that made every possible future um, open to them. In operant conditioning, an animal or a human being is given a reward at the moment they display the desired behavior. Oh, am I talking too much? Oh, I'm sorry. Zip. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chocolate? <laughs> yes, please. This is to condition the behavior to reoccur. Oh, hey, Kim. Yeah, I... you know what? Hold on, let me take this in the hall. An example would be rewarding a student with a high grade when they perform exceptionally well on an essay. It sounds harmless, but what do you think happens when a student writes something in an exam which is contrary to mainstream approval or perhaps questions the authority of the teacher or the textbook from which the teacher regurgitates, they are given negative reinforcements, which could be a fail grade, ridicule from a teacher, suspension, or simply told that they are wrong and to accept that because it comes from authority. Students are conditioned to reject anything that does not fall into the accepted parameters of beliefs or thoughts, and to refrain from questioning or challenging authority. Just like the Prussian educational system that was exported to America, the intent of all government educational systems throughout the world is to cultivate a docile, obedient citizenry. For if the people ever learn to question the validity of authority, then the institutions of control, such as government, may cease to exist. The utilization of theories predicated on the observation of animals assumes that the behavior of rats, pigeons and dogs can accurately explain the behavior of humans. Skinner said that humans learn behavior the same way that the pigeon learned to turn in a complete circle. And again like the pigeon, humans can be conditioned by the same methods and their choices can be controlled. Not surprisingly, this premise is highly controversial, with many opponents contending that we can't generalize from studies on animals, since human physiology and anatomy is inextricably different, and these studies omit the human potential 
for reason, patience, memory, self-control, and all the other concomitants of human consciousness. Others hold this premise as voracious solely in situations where the tasks are close to the animalistic level of mechanical activity, which would mean that by using these behavioristic techniques on students, they are seemingly reducing education to the animalistic level of learning. That is why you do not become educated by going to school. It's oxymoronic. Schools cultivate animal consciousness. Education cultivates human consciousness. Unfortunately, under Skinner's influence, educational psychology in the United States leaned heavily towards behaviorism and operant conditioning. So henceforth, teachers assumed the role as animal trainers rather than guides in academic learning. Students became dependent on extrinsic rather than intrinsic rewards. And most nefarious of all, students were now susceptible to being controlled and molded in the wishes of whoever exerted influence over the government. Today, teachers are forced to follow a prescribed script of instructions, preventing any room for variation, creativity or ingenuity. The fact is, that the teacher is a performer of a government foundation-approved pre-written script and upon completion of the delineated outcomes, they receive a reward to reinforce what they've learned. Does this sound like education? Or does it sound like animal training? To further our understanding of schooling today, we turn to Benjamin Bloom. In 1956, Bloom published his influential book titled Taxonomy of Educational Objectives. In it, Bloom provided a methodology to restructure American education. In Bloom's own words, it was a tool to classify the ways individuals are to act, think, or feel as the result of some unit of instruction, and that the teacher's role was to ensure that every student attain the specified objectives delineated by government. That's the Skinner method, performance-based, results-based. That's all what you, what you can do, not what you know in your head. They don't want children to think or know anything, no history. No. It's what you can do for the good of the global economy. It's all about conforming to the standards set by the curriculum. So upon graduation, you are ripe to fit into the state and perform a role for the aggrandizement of the state. As we now know, government-mandated curricula and pedagogy has disparaged the development of intellectual and cognitive faculties in students, instead placing greater importance on their beliefs, values, and behaviors. Perhaps the program most indicative of this transformation is values clarification, which is a form of character education reminiscent of Robert Owen's socialist schools 150 years earlier. However, it is not primarily concerned with people's held values per se, but the actual process of establishing values, and it's predicated on moral relativism, which postulates there exists no right set of values. Moral relativism is a belief system that asserts there is no global absolute moral law that applies to all people for all time and in all places. Instead, it claims that personal and situational encounters dictate the correct moral position. Truth and morality are relative. There are no absolutes. 
Values clarification says that every child should make up his own or her own values. In point of fact, that's not the way it works. You begin with relativism, and then you ask questions that are open-ended regarding abortion, regarding family planning, regarding sexuality. It's just like any other people. They just can't get married like that. I mean, one might have a disease and they won't get married and they won't even know about it. And then maybe the other person might catch it and then they won't be able to get married. A man and a woman could have a disease. What you want to do is to make sure that each child can express whatever he likes. Yeah, it doesn't should get married. Yeah, if they love someone, let them get married. I don't know. Who cares if we will gay? Do you care? No. At the end of the day, this is not a case of every child making up his own mind. The goal of value clarification has been achieved. The outcome has already been determined by the curriculum. It's the same technique that salesmen use all the time. Would you like a red car or a blue car? Do you want that in 10 days or 30 days? You always get a choice, but I control the universe of choices. That's how various clarification works. If I control the universe of choices, I can mold someone's behavior. And they always think that they thought it up by themselves because they didn't realize that I controlled the box. That's why value clarification is wrong because it makes the child think that they made up their own mind when they really didn't because I gave them some very concrete guidelines inside of which they had to make up their mind. And it's a very valid way of changing a behavior. Beside the fact that values clarification is flagrantly a far step from the original purpose of schools and the state for that matter, the paramount reason to reject this exercise is because it espouses the relativity of moral values. This relativistic view of morals is extremely dangerous because it means any moral position can be rationalized and justified by inferring that there exists neither objective morality nor truth. If you've ever wondered why contemporary society is so decadent and so immoral, you now know one major contributing factor, state-controlled education. You see, the state wants citizens who subscribe to moral relativism, and it makes sense. How else would individuals accept legal wars of aggression or arbitrary laws written by men? How else would society at large accept that a class of individuals has the moral authority to accost, transgress, kidnap, assault and even kill other people with impunity? This is why atheism had to be the religion of public schools because it's much harder to indoctrinate students into relativism who believe in an absolute, objective moral law bestowed by a higher power. This is the Bettendorf survey. It goes with understanding and appreciating others. Can, are you male or female? What year are you? This is given to high school students. Do you regard yourself as a bigot? Which of the above do you think would be most likely to eliminate an entire race? Who has most influenced the way you feel about other races? With whose influence have you most strongly disagreed? If you could eliminate an entire race, would you? Which one? Also perilous is that values clarification allows the acceptance of two contradictory moral positions to be held by the students, since there's no such thing as right and wrong. And it contains no adequate criteria by which to resolve value disagreements. In the end, children are left devoid of absolute morals and incapable of resolving any conflicts. The system of government schooling, most used throughout the world today, known as outcome-based education, is ultimately an amalgamation of Benjamin Bloom's mastery learning Skinner's behavior modification and values clarification. Whereas traditional education 
primarily focused on providing the resources that would be available to the student, which are called inputs. Outcome-based education focuses on outputs, which are the government delineated outcomes that the student must demonstrate upon his graduation. In other words, the state doesn't just provide the finance and resources, but now prescribes the content, goals, and the general purpose of education. So, the EQA was the basis for curriculum planning for all the districts in the state. And it was a mandatory test. The districts had to take it because they had to base their long-range plan on it in order to get their state money. What did the EQA test? The EQA tested first the 10, then the 12 quality goals of education. When we looked at the EQA, parents thought it was testing reading, writing, self-esteem, citizenship. It tested locus of control, whether you are an internally motivated person or an externally motivated person, whether you stand up against a crowd, or whether you go with the flow. And they scored it. There was a right answer to the attitude questions. The right answer was go with the flow. I would join the group if, A, my best friend were a member of the group. Child could say yes, no, or maybe. The correct answer was yes. I would join the group if all the popular kids were members of the group, yes, no, or maybe. The correct answer was yes. I would join the group if my parents would ground me if they found out. The correct answer was no. You are supposed to avoid punishment, but you are supposed to honor commitments to friends and go with the group. The goal was collectivism. Get it? Under communism, virtually everything belongs to the state. The individual has little right to own property, or to plan his own life. He's told where to work with his employer. Little freedom to leave his job or seek a better one. Whereas we believe, and our religions teach, that the individual is all important. Communism denies religion and debases the individual to a part of the vast machine that powers the state. Children are taken early and molded to fit the machine. Here is no search for truth. The government writes the textbooks and the children are taught to accept communism and their fate without question. The EQA out of over 400 questions, 30 of them were academic, and 385 of them were attitudes. Outcome-based education does not say the school will teach. It says the student must demonstrate. Your child will conform, or they will not move forward. They will meet the goal. So where is it coming from? Where is the driving force? As we started tracing back, what we found was a report called the SCANS. Secretary's Commission on Achieving Necessary Skills. This is the 1992 edition. This was not written by the Secretary of Education. This was written by the Secretary of Labor. Of Labor. What we found is it's not being driven by education. It's being driven by the big, big, big industries. That's who's driving the changes. When we read the scans, the scans talked all about what we need to have the proper worker of tomorrow. And the children were not referred to as children. They were referred to as human resource material, human capital. Many times as I've, as I've traveled and, and talked to people about what's happening in Pennsylvania education and why parents need to get involved, I get told, well, you see, it doesn't matter to me because my children don't go to the public school. My children are in parochial school, they're in Christian school, they're in private school, I homeschool. Simultaneously with the new regulation changes, teacher certification is changing. And in order to be certified, teachers will have to demonstrate that they are competent in outcome-based education and that they, that's what the colleges will teach, that's what the teachers will learn. Non-public schools have to have certified teachers too. Please do not think that because your children are not in a public school, that you are home free. You are not. The state cannot afford to let 
a huge bunch of children slip through the cracks. Because it will be obvious then who can read and who can't. And one of the things that happens with outcome-based education is, you know, we talked about what happens with all the kids. Achievement goes down. Now that doesn't show up because everybody gets an A. But these were the world's leading psychologists. These were men who had done all of their experiments on animals. Edward L. Thorndike thought he could learn a lot about how children learn by studying chickens. And he became the leading exponent of educational psychology. He was the one who developed the, stimu the stimulus response technique, which is used to this day, stimulus response. Well, Thorndike did his experiments on chickens. Pavlov did his experiments with dogs. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Pavlov dog, the salivating, the conditioned salivating dogs, the conditioning techniques. Uh, John B. Watson did his experiments with rats. And Skinner, B.F. Skinner, of course, continued to do his experiments with rats. You see, B.F. Skinner doesn't believe that there's much of a difference between a rat and a human being. We are now locked into an educational system that views your children as animals to be cultivated as future human resources. Students are treated as stimulus response mechanisms which require behavioral conditioning so that they can conform to the state standards of desired behavior. In this view of so-called education, what is important is the observable behavior and attitudes of the students. Forget their intellectual capacities and innate talents. Since they postulate that all human behavior is derived from the external stimuli which refines and molds us, then it follows that education is to become the manipulation of the student's environment so that he or she can be shaped into the behavioral piece of meat desired by whoever controls the government. Schools today constitute a major part of the tools used for social control. This, this system gives whoever is in control of the state the opportunity to mold the character of the children to their values. It changes children to the state desired response and whoever controls the state controls the response. The whole issue here is who owns the children. The more time you spend with the kids, the more control you have over the kids. It's about control. That's really what, I mean, when you boil it all down, that's what we come down to, is who controls the children of the next generation. So who controls the children? Who influences their worldviews, their values, their understanding of morality or lack of, their behavior, their philosophy, and their religion? Who is it incumbent upon to teach and inform the aforementioned to the children? The state assumes that it is their role and their responsibility, and they have created an institution along the lines of the oppressive Prussian system which performs to that assumption. And just like in Prussia, the parental-child relationship is considered subordinate to the state's relationship with the children. Parents are obligated to send their children to school for 12 formative years. And the schools are compelled to teach government-controlled curriculum and hire only government-certified teachers. What you have in reality is the perfect indoctrination system. Whatever the state wants from their citizens, they merely inculcate into the children. Do you really think they desire an educated, liberated individual with critical thinking skills who can discern truth from falsity? Of course not. With the preponderance of such individuals, 
the state would not be able to control population and the legitimacy of its existence would be seriously questioned. In reality, the state desires a docile, obedient population easily controllable by the few and that is what they have cultivated. We also know that industry and foundations concern themselves with the schooling of children or should I say future human resources. The Carnegie Endowment in tandem with the Rockefeller Foundation actively sought to transform American society from a constitutional republic into a collectivist, authoritarian state. You must leave the city. If you remain in the city, you will be in violation of the Pennsylvania Crimes Code. To avoid backlash and revolt, the usurpation of individual liberties and inherent rights has to be conducted gradually over time to an indoctrinated population who will acquiesce as a result of ignorance or apathy. The means they concluded that would accomplish this agenda was the altering of American history and the control of the American educational system. The rewriting of American history would allow them to de-emphasize and obfuscate liberty and its concomitant absolute principles fought for and established in early America. And the government takeover of American education coupled with their money and influence publicly and privately would allow them to shape and mold the character and behavior of the children using the pedagogical methodologies based on experimental psychology and behaviorism. What your government pays for, it gets. When we understand that, then we look at government-financed institutions of education and see the kind of students and the kind of education that's being turned out by these government-financed schools, logic will tell you that if what is being turned out in those schools was not in accord with what the state and the federal government wanted, then it would change it. The bottom line is that the government is getting what they have ordered. They do not want your children to be educated. They do not want you to think too much. That is why our country and our world has become so proliferated with entertainments, mass media, television shows, amusement parks, drugs, alcohol, and every kind of entertainment to keep the human mind entertained so that you don't get in the way of important people by doing too much thinking. But there's a reason, there's a reason. There's a reason for this, there's a reason education sucks, and it's the same reason that it will never, ever, ever be fixed. It's because the owners of this country don't want that. I'm talking about the real owners now. It's the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. They're, they're, they're an irrelevant. Th the politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. But I'll tell you what they don't want. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interest. That's right. You know something? They don't want people who are smart enough to sit around the kitchen table to figure out how badly they're getting fucked by a system that threw them overboard 30 fucking years ago. They don't want that. You know what they want? They want obedient workers. Obedient workers. I quoted the uh, Trilateral Commission view of the educational system, uh, namely it's a system of indoctrination of the young. And I think that's correct. It's a system of indoctrination of the young. That was the way the liberal elites regard it, and they're more or less accurate. Uh, so the educational system is supposed to train people to be uh, obedient, conformist, 
not think too much, uh, do what you're told, stay passive, don't cause any crisis of democracy, don't raise any questions, and so on. That's basically what the uh, system is about. Evidently, the purpose of government-controlled education is not to educate us, quite the opposite in fact. However, we do not need the government to educate us, for it never has and it never will. Opportunely, as human beings, we are endowed with all the requisite faculties to ensure our own education independently. And it is imperative, now more than ever, that we cultivate and utilize that innate potential and in turn give our children the tools and understanding so they can do the same. It is incumbent upon us individuals to provide an environment for our children conducive to real education, an environment that fosters independent thinking, self-directed learning, intrinsic motivation, empathy and compassion all the tools needed for the realization of every human's innate potential. A potential that is anathema to those who wish to control. Because once realized, the conscious human being is limitless, boundless, uncontrollable, and inexorably evolves out of the state of thraldom and servitude into the state of freedom and liberty. It is up to you.